This is Beyond with Heather Tesh, where we examine near-death experiences and life itself, hopefully making this life a little better. Hello, and thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. My guest today is Wayne Morrison. Wayne, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, it's a pleasure. Thank you, Heather. It is so good to have you here. You have a very fascinating near-death experience. So if you could start on the day it happened and fill us in. Okay. The day it happened, uh, it was in 1972. I was 17 years old and I had uh, gone to a party and I'd been taking medication. I I can't really recall back then what I had. I might have had a cold or something, but I there was drinks being passed around and these were guys who were older than me. They were Navy guys. So I was 17. They were probably in their early 20s. I didn't really know them that well, but like those things went in that day, somebody invited you, you went. And so I started drinking and uh, relaxing. And uh, at some point, and it's never been clear to me, and I've always been honest about this, I don't really know what happened. At one point I was drinking and I was feeling a little odd. And at the very next point, I was in a totally different place. And I would just like to start by talking about this place uh, as very a very definite place, not some sort of hallucinogenic or vague sort of place. It was a real place. And I was moving through this dark, uh, what I guess I would call a tunnel, but I, I wonder if I've added that word over the years because it's been used so much. But it did feel like that. I felt like I was moving very swiftly, but not that I consciously looked for my hands or arms, but I don't remember feeling like I was a body, and yet I did feel like I was clearly a presence. I felt all there, but I could not have moved at the rate it felt like I was moving at in a human body, at least the way I remember it. And as I was moving, there was this dark rumbling sound that seemed to be so deep, it vibrated within my body and all around me. And when I describe that, it sounds like it would be terrifying, but it was really the opposite of terrifying. It was pretty calming. And I started moving forward faster. And as I did, I came into this, well, I I take that back. Uh, Up ahead, I could see a light at the end of this black tunnel. And as I approached the light, I was looking down on fields of flowers and just a beautiful scene like I I, like you couldn't really create even in a movie and these flowers were some of them were really huge I don't really know how big but they appeared they could be 50 feet or they could be 30 feet big and they were all making music or at least I feel like the music came from them but the music was saturating the air and it was inside of me as well as inside of them and somehow we were communicating. And by that, I don't mean specifics. I I wasn't asking questions, but it felt like those flowers were actually there to support me, literally. And as I moved forward, there appeared these presences of light. And they had a vague shape of bodies, but they weren't clearly defined. I could not see their features. And when I got to them, they made it clear to me that I was going to meet a, a, a being of a high order. Now, the, re- the reason I phrase it that way is uh, maybe I need to give a little background. I was raised non-religiously, which was an anti- not anti-religiously. I just wasn't raised in a religion. And at that point in my life, I was probably agnostic or atheistic. Um, I probably didn't believe in God. Well, I'm pretty sure I didn't believe in God, but they told me I was meeting this being of a high order and this being came forward from way off in the distance. It was a little tiny speck of light and it got brighter and brighter until it was hovering. Well, I feel like it was hovering or he was hovering. It felt like a male presence. And again, not clearly defined, but a brilliant light. And as I, as As he came near me, it wrapped me in this sort of warmth and comfort and acceptance 
which is really hard to explain here on earth. Uh, but it was like unconditional acceptance, unconditional love. I, that's the only way I can put it. No questions asked. There were no qualifiers. It was simply acceptance. And I could feel this joy within me. And I could also feel the joy within him. And he was, uh, the, the, the best way I could describe it is uh, being a father, if you had a, a little baby and the baby was maybe trying to learn to walk and fell down a little and started laughing. This is how this presence treated me, like I was like, like a baby, really. He found a lot of humor in my excitement and my questions. And the questions came really rapidly. And the questions had to do with uh, various things. One of them was, I, I remember this, because for some reason as a kid, I was captivated by UFOs. And I wanted to know if there were other civilizations in the universe. And there, uh, you, you don't need to ask the question. You simply need to start thinking about it. And it's answered. And it's answered in uh, a multitude of ways. In this case, I was transported, I don't know how far, I just really, really far, and instant, instantly. And I, it's hard to describe time and space there because it's, it's not like here. You know, it just, I'll, I'll skip trying to explain it. But I was looking down at civilizations, various civilizations, and some appeared to me like they were almost like in Roman garb. And others appeared to be what my mind at that time conceived of as more modern. And I, I did all this from above, you know, almost like looking down. Well, it was looking down. My presence was looking down at it, but I didn't get down on the street. I didn't meet beings or anything like that. I was just observing this. And then when I came back, I had a, a very important question I wanted to ask. And I need to back up here. When I was moving through the black tunnel, I had this thought in my mind and it just overrode everything. It was, I am going to learn the secret meaning of life. It was just like a repetitive mantra. Not that I would have even known what a mantra was back then, but that's how I would see it now. And as I looked at this being, I said, what is the meaning of life? And the being instantly <clears throat> put inside me somehow that it was love. And again, I never heard the word love. It wasn't L-O-V-E. It was this sort of deep, comprehensive understanding that I remember, but I could never duplicate here. And I remember being so excited that my soul, my spirit, uh, was doing like somersaults in the air. And uh, I remember him laughing, chuckling. He just thought it was really funny. I don't know. But in a, in a good natured way, he wasn't laughing at me. He was laughing with me. He was feeling my joy. And uh, I was feeling that connection to him. And then at some point, we move into a black expanse. And when I say we, I feel like these guides, I can't remember if this presence who, uh, I actually, this presence I never named because I always was rigid about not coloring what happened to me and being totally honest, including the fact that I wasn't going to mislead anyone and say I was pronounced dead. You know, I wasn't. I just, what happened, happened. And we moved into a black expanse and I was allowed to ask a series of questions. And in front of me, I saw <laughs> the world appear like on a, uh, on an ultra I, I, well, it was like the world. I don't know if you could describe it as a video screen. Video screens didn't really even exist. It was 1972. But I saw the world just rapidly, and by I said rapidly, I mean almost instantaneously go through metamorphosis and uh, from really nothing to, to uh, growth and humans and a lot of violence. I saw armies clashing with each other. And again, this is from a far, far distance. It's not up close. And I somehow was able to absorb all this information. I understood what it all meant and that it was connected 
to me and that I was connected to it and we were all interrelated. Again, it's not something I could ever explain to anybody here. It's, it's hard enough for me to try to come to grips with what happened to me. So I understood things I could never understand here is all I'm trying to say. And uh, at some point, the message was delivered to me that I was going to return to Earth. I don't remember how that message was delivered, but I remember fighting it. And I, I, I don't know if I threw a fit. I remember I was just not willing to do it. I knew where I wanted to be and I was going to stay there. And uh, so at that point, it was communicated to me. And I don't know if it was communicated by this being I mentioned or if it was communicated by the other beings, but somehow I understood that I had a mission. Um, and, I, and I guess I would say an important mission that I had to return for. And I was paying attention <laughs> and uh, all these beings and then some, like I don't know if it was hundreds or thousands of light beings, they all had light. And they all seemed to float up around me and they created uh, music that was, that is impossible for me to describe here. I just, there's nothing I could describe it like. Uh, it, it resonated, it was in harmony with, with itself, but it was also somehow spontaneous. It wasn't, it, what, you could tell it wasn't a rehearsed thing. It wasn't like a classical piece of music or any of that. It was as if they were creating, they were creating this sound and it was all in support of me to return, which, you know, I mean, I was 17. Even now I just go, what? <laughs> but that's what happened. And uh, from there, I woke up. Well, I don't know if the word is woke up. I, I simply looked around and I was standing in in a bathroom of this apartment that I don't think I'd ever been in before in my life. And I, and I had a razor blade. I found a razor blade. And I uh, was determined to slash my wrist. And I always want everyone to really listen to this part because I was not in despair. It was the opposite. I was filled with joy. And uh, I wanted to go back from where I came. Now, how and why I knew that was the answer, I, I can't say. I have no reason to, I don't remember anyone ever saying to me, you're dead or you passed out or anything like that. I just had that experience. But somehow I knew that if I slashed my wrist and died, I could return there. And uh, this is the only mystical, what I would cast as mystical thing that happened after this was uh, a deep, resonant voice said, no. And as he did, someone opened the bathroom door and I dropped the razor blade and the guy said, hey guys, he's in here. And that was the end of it. That ended right there. From there, uh, I'm 17 and I was, uh, you know, had a lot of, lot of uh, I had like a lot of 17 year olds. I had my issues, you know, there were a lot of things going wrong and uh, everything seemed to go right at that point. And in retrospect, was it because of that? I don't know. I just know that at that point, I told my girlfriend at the time, she was younger than me by a year or so. And I told her what had happened and she accepted it because she knew I wasn't a lunatic and she knew I wasn't using heroin and doing these kind of things, you know. And uh, she accepted it, but it was 1972 and I had zero context, nothing. I, maybe, maybe there were books out there, I don't know but I had no reference to this at all. And so I ended up, uh, my girlfriend and I, she got pregnant, we got married, I went in the Air Force. And after just about eight years in the Air Force, I left the Air Force and I became a police officer in Newport, Rhode Island, and uh, ultimately spent 30 years there and retired as the captain of detectives. Uh, and in and in between there, there's a whole life because I had two daughters, five grandchildren, six now. <laughs> I have a great grandchild. I can't even. Wow. Well, you can see how young I was when I got married. Uh, I have a great grandchild, five grandchildren, two daughters, 
And uh, we traveled. We went to Colorado. We went to the Philippines. We went to upstate New York. And then I got out of the Air Force. And when I got out of the Air Force, I returned to something I had done as a youth, which was to play music. And I began to play music in uh, bands and duos, mostly folk music, uh, Irish music, bluegrass music, that sort of music. But I, I played a lot of different music. And so we traveled with the music a little bit. My wife became a director of tourism in Newport. And so we traveled with her. So we had very active lives. We, we traveled a lot. We were very fortunate in the jobs we got. Uh, yeah, we were very, what I would, would now call blessed. I wouldn't have used that word then, but looking back, I can see somebody was watching over me, you know, I can see it. Uh, and then that's the, yeah, that pretty much, oh, I'm sorry. I left out a, a piece I have to say. So it's 1972. I have no context. I, we go in the Air Force. I'm in Denver, Colorado, and I'm in a, our living room watching TV. And there's a daytime TV show, which I think it was Merv Griffin. That was a thing back then. And uh, he introduces a doctor named Raymond Moody. And I go, okay, so what's this? And this doctor says, well, I've written this book, Life After Life. I go, I'm listening. And all of a sudden, he starts to tell these accounts. <laughs> and I go, what? And I jump up off this couch and I said to my wife, this is it. This is what happened. These, these things, this is what happened to me. And I could tell, I mean, they were so clearly I, I, the, the tunnel, the, the presence, the what a lot of people refer to as telepathy, you know, because uh, I'm, I'm talking a little out of order here. But when, when you're there and, and you want to know something like, let's say I wanted to know who Heather was, it wouldn't be like it was described. Well, Heather was this girl who grew up here and did this. You would sort of become Heather uh, uh, and you would be Heather. You might even be Heather's mother or father or sister or brother. There were a myriad of ways that you could experience and did experience answers. There, there wasn't this thing we do here, which is to use symbols, to describe a symbol, to describe a symbol and hope that somebody understands what you're saying. So over the years, what happened with me was um, since I had professional career, I was always leery outside of my family and friends to discuss what had happened to me with my family and friends. I always did. Uh, but at some point, for some reason, I made a video in my bedroom. I think I was a lieutenant at the time. And I, I just felt my daughter asked me, she said, why would you do this? It seems the opposite of how you would be. And I said, I have no answer. I don't know why I made that video and said what happened and put it out there just on my own on a YouTube channel. And then I guess over the years, uh, a couple different places picked up on it and said, would you be in interviewed? And so I, you know, I, I agreed because I began to change my mind about uh, why, how I should treat this. Uh, I guess in the beginning, there's a song that was a hit by uh, Peter Gabriel called Salisbury Hill back in, I guess, I'm going to say either the 90s, or early 2000s. And uh, there's a line in there that resonated with me, which was to keep in silence. I resigned. My friends would think I was a nut turning water into wine. Open doors would soon be shut. And and that's sort of how I saw it. I can't really discuss this with people because they'll think I'm crazy. I didn't think I was crazy, but. And you know, I, I saw see. that I saw that video probably I'm going to say 10 years ago. Maybe it was five. Wow. But I didn't know. Yeah. I didn't think you're crazy. There are so many of us that really enjoy yeah. hearing these stories. Yeah. And so what's happened to me now, I'm in my 60s, and uh, I've changed. A, a lot has changed. I, I've come. My wife used to say, well, you know, you're on this level or, or you're on that level. And I would resist her. I would say, no, that's not true, because I think there was a false arrogance in me that didn't want to say, well, I'm here and you're there or whatever. But we were having this discussion not long ago. And I said, you know, I agree with you, but I'd like to call it a plane. I think we're all on different planes is how I've come to see it. So in our existences, I've come to accept that there are people who totally understand what happened to me and can totally relate to it. And there are people who never will. And it's not my mission. This is how I've come to accept it to try to change their minds. And I'm not trying to, you know, 
I'm not trying to start Jonestown or something. All, all I can tell them is what happened to me. And for a kid who was an atheist agnostic, it changed my life. And it changed my life for me very in very gradual steps. Like I didn't run out the door and say, hallelujah, I'm born again. It wasn't that. It was it just kept increasing over the years, this presence of of understanding what I would call understanding that this life is transitory. And I'm not saying unimportant. It's probably very, very important. And I've got my own theories about it now. And I, and I I'm free to discuss those in the beginning. I just always wanted to relate exactly what happened. But now I feel more free to, you know, talk about it from how I feel about it. Well, I think there are so many people out there that need to hear it because wh whether they're hurting because they lost someone or they're afraid of what's coming down the line for them. So let's talk about some of those theories coming up. I want to focus first, though. You mentioned the light and the way you described it, I was curious, was that important being the light or did he come out of the light? That's a great question. That important being, I think, was the light. I've never thought about it, but I think as I think back on it, that light was so distant, but so clear. And as it came here, it enveloped me. But but it could have been the other one, too. It could have been. And I just was ignorant of that. You know, I may not have realized the light is so much more vast than what I saw. But this was an incredible light that... And it's not like, you know, it's hard to describe this light because this light was a warmth. It was palpable. It wasn't just physical. It wasn't like we turn on a light bulb. You know what I mean? It was it was a, a presence, this light. And who do you think that light was? I now believe it was Jesus. I did not believe that then. I believed it was God or possibly Jesus. But the, re the reason I say this is uh, Jesus and I have had a tug of war for 60 odd years on my part, because I've always resisted this, this earth mind always resist. Well, you know, there's no proof. There's not a, no evidence, but at some point here in the last few years, I've come to accept it was Jesus. And I really don't care if it was Jesus. I, it doesn't really matter to me because I know Jesus wouldn't care. Jesus doesn't care about that stuff. Uh, or, or let's not even call him Jesus. Let's call him anything. Let's just call it the presence. The presence only cares, I think, that you understand and move forward in this life to the best of your capabilities. And it's not for me to judge where people are at. That's That was an awakening for me because I always said, this person, How when I was young, I would look around, I go, why, why don't people feel what I feel? How come they don't understand the things I understand all the time? And uh, now I kind of get it. They just simply don't. Or they understand a lot more than I do. There's that too. You know, if I now can listen to somebody like, I don't, I, you may be familiar with uh, this person, Eckhart Tolle. Sure. I listened to him the other day and I go, this guy gets a lot of things, you know, and he probably got them way before I'm starting to get them. So in a lot of ways, a lot of ways for me, I feel like I'm just being born. I know that sounds odd in, in the physical stage here, but I feel like uh, a lot of epiphanies and revelations are coming to me on a daily basis now. And uh, I'm so much better at, not cured from, not judging people. So I, I, that was something, you know, I was taught to judge. You know, that's how I grew up. Uh, I think that's how most of us grew up. We had to use our judgment, but then at some point it can become a dangerous thing because you can start labeling people and you do. And uh, I had a, a talk with the, the NDE interviewer, Lee Whitting, and it, I was talking about prejudices, you know, and uh, I think a lot of people in America at this time would say, oh, you mean like white against black? Uh, yeah, I do, but I mean a whole bunch of other things. I mean, uh, white against Asian. I mean, um, man against woman. I mean, and we got into this conversation, um, society against police and probably reverse to police against society. There, there are so many prejudices that color our thoughts. 
And when I was 18 years old uh, and went into the Air Force, they made me a police officer against my will. I mean, I think I said this to Lee. I said, short of president of the United States, that was the last job I could ever have accepted that somebody would put me in. But it happened, which in hindsight is sort of a, an interesting karmic development, I think, uh, because I, I, I grew up very, I don't want to get into politics, but uh, let's just say I grew up in an environment in which I distrusted and disliked the police intensely. And when I became one and I started seeing that the majority of the men and women were good, decent people who cared about people, I, it changed my life because I didn't get that from a distance because I only understood what many of us understand if we don't, what's, what's the Indian saying, walk a mile in my moccasins. You know, I had never walked in, in the role of a police officer and I ended up doing that and it uh, changed my life for the better in many ways. And there were rough spots too. It's hard being a police officer because enormous pressures are put on you, uh, you know, in a, in a moment and you have to make big decisions. I was lucky enough that I was in Rhode Island. I mean, I, I look at the people in Chicago, New York, you know, the big cities, and I, I can't fathom how they would deal with the, the multitude of daily problems. And I, I talked to a guy who used to be in uh, Delaware, and at that time they were the second leading homicide city. I'm trying to remember the city. It's, the, it's a big one. And uh, he said it. I pull up and there'll be five or six dead bodies. And I said, you know, I, I pull, I've seen dead bodies. I was a cop, but, um, you know, not five or six in a murder scene. That's, I can't even comprehend that to be quite honest. Well, I, I think that's with so many things that when you're looking from the outside, you have not always, uh, the same perception when you're in it and you can see it very, very differently. And I heard you say something which relates to this. And you have a phrase about how, also, when people talk, how we can misinterpret, or we usually do misinterpret what people say. Do you remember that phrase? Um, yes. I, I, are you referring to, I, I said that, I tell my family this all the time, that I don't think anybody very often understands anything that somebody is saying to them. Is that the yes. one you mean? That's exactly yeah. what I mean. I see that all the yeah. time. Yes. Yeah our communication sometimes we think we're being clear and then we're not. Yes. And I yes. even noticed that in this, in recording myself with these podcasts is you say one thing and you think in your brain, it's coming out a certain way. But then when you yes. hear it back, you're like, Oh, that exactly. wasn't exactly didn't, you know, that didn't come out like I meant it to come out. And Lee said to me, Lee Whitting, he said, Dr. Raymond Moody, who he personally knows the mm -hmm. guy I talked about mm -hmm. writing the book, life after life. Yeah. He said, Raymond said to me, we need to invent a language because English, I, I would say any language in the world, is insufficient. Uh, and I said to Lee, I go, it's been invented. It's, it's there, though. You, you just got to be able to access it. And at least in my life, the only way I've accessed it is in that moment in time and space where I went there, which presumably I will go to again or some form of. I don't fear death anymore. I did fear death up to that point, by the way. I, as a young kid, I was, if the thought of death came into my mind, it, it terrified me. And I do know people like that and older. And um, the only thing I can tell them is they can take my word for it or not. It's okay. I'm not personally offended, but there is no death. We, we're, we're part of a great creation. Uh, all these, and w w there is no death. We're, we're going to go on and on. How? I'm not sure. I don't pretend to have that answer. Uh, but we're going to go on and on. And uh, I've come to the realization, <sighs> this is a belief. This isn't something that I was told, or if I was told, I don't remember that I was told. But I believe when I, when I look at the ancient stories of the fall from grace or Satan and those things, I've come to formulate the idea that we were with God and we are with God. We're not disconnected. We just are in a dream that likes to believe we're disconnected. I think we sort of said, and again, this is just a theory I have. Hey God, we got this great idea. We're going to go off 
and do our own thing. And if you don't mind, we're just going to like take a break from you. And God, because he loved us so much, let us do it. But probably whispered to somebody, hey, you know, I'm not going to really let them go off on their own because this will not end well. And so I believe that the original mission of coming to Earth this earth, and I don't know how many others there are, but this earth was to prove God doesn't exist. I believe that's why we came here, to prove God doesn't exist. And why would and we then, do that? Because I think this was the free will part, where we wanted to go off on our own and just have our own existence and prove we, maybe, maybe I don't know, we wanted to prove we didn't need God. I'm not sure. I'm speculating. Mm. But I believe now uh, all of us are on a rescue mission for God. And to the level we can see that, wake, awaken to it, or, or in some cases, some people live it. You know, they, they're, they're on different levels, different planes, I would prefer to say, than I am, where, uh, like in, I believe in Buddhism, they call it bodhisattva, where, where they're sacrificing their very existence, coming here to help other people. And uh, I would never put myself in that category. My, my, uh, for me, it's been a slow turning. You know, I've, I've, this has been decades in the making for Wayne Morrison. What I feel is happening with me is the Wayne Morrison who uh, was the, um, suffered the typical brash arrogance of youth has given way to more of the spiritual being God created versus the thing Wayne Morrison. I, I, I used it. I, I you know, I, I, I really was a very, um, I think people would probably say, oh yeah, he was a character, you know, when they look back on it. I was pretty emphatic and active and verbal. And uh, I am not as much of that anymore. And that has been partly by choice, but mostly in my opinion, by salvation, because I'm being brought out of the egoic world uh, slowly, thankfully, because I, you know, I'm just a, in, in a spiritual term, I would think I'm just a, an infant. I'm just really coming out of this and beginning to accept that we're not these characters we made, these people, these roles we play. And I get, well, I get, we play them. I mean, and I, I'm thankful that I got these roles to play, but I also, for me, I need to recognize that these roles were a stepping stone to why we're really here. And it's not to make a lot of money and it's not to be a hero and it's not to be famous. Uh, it, to me, it's really to return to the full awareness of God and creation. And I think so many of us are very similar to you that we are learning along the way. And, and as we grow older, we come to understand things more. And I also think people like you are really helping other people to come along themselves and to grow in various ways. Do you mean because of the experience I had? No, I, th I think just in life in general, I think your, your experience certainly helped push you in that direction. But I think as we're exposed to things like this, and just as we learn and grow, we become wiser in so many cases. Yes. I heard uh, Bob Dylan recently say, a man, you could say a man or a woman, but he, he wrote, a man trades his youth for wisdom. And I it resonated. I said, okay, I get that. That is so I true. That is so true. And you also were mentioning the ego. And I had a, a guest recently, Jeff Olson, who was really fascinating. And we were talking about the ego, and he said something that I hadn't thought of before. He said the ego is kind of like lifting weights. And, you know, yes. you, you need to grow that resistance to the ego. So you need the ego to grow. Yes. Wow. And Jeff was the man in the car accident. Is that right? Yes, he was in a uh, horrible car accident. I, yeah. And, and that's how I first saw you. And I, I told you the story. I said, well, I don't know who this is. I said, let me just see. Oh, she's got a site here. And I hit it. And I said to my wife, look, this is the one we just watched a couple weeks ago. Because it, it left a big impact. He was profoundly um, impactful. Uh, and yes, I would agree with that. And also, uh, I, I think, and this is unfortunate in our earthly lives, 
But I think it's also true that when things are really good for us, and we all want, most of us want things to be really good for us, we don't spiritually grow much. It's in times of trouble that we tend to find our deeper, deeper growth, I believe. So when things, you know, I have a daughter. So her son, uh, her son, my, uh, sorry, I got a little emotional here. My, uh, her husband got uh, cancer in his thirties and he died and he left behind two kids. And she's become very, very spiritually oriented. And I can't help but believe that that horrible process of losing her husband was what catapulted it. And maybe it was planned, even though that seems so hard to fathom. I know. Yes. So if you listen to to different people, uh, including Betty Eady comes to mind, that maybe, I mean... And Frank, you know, to, to plan to be in uh, Auschwitz to, uh, um, as Lee Whitting pointed out, he said, uh, George Floyd, he said, somebody had to agree to give up their life. I go, you're right. I, I hadn't really thought about it. And I said, and somebody had to give up their freedom. And what was that all about? I don't know. I don't know. You know, all these events that happen. Is it for a greater purpose? Right. Is it for a greater purpose? And I will say when I'm in the really difficult events, it is really hard to see that this is meant to be. But once I'm past them, I'm like, okay, this led me to this. And this makes a lot of sense. Exactly. And uh, that's so that's where I feel it's it's at for me now. Uh, I can't say it ended up there because I, I believe with all my heart, you don't end up anywhere. You know, I think you go on in a multitude of ways. I don't know. Uh, I, I guess I could believe in, in reincarnation at this stage. I, I always resisted it because I really don't want to come back here and do this all again. I'll be honest with you. I, you know, where if I get reincarnated, I hope it's like a better deal. <laughs> I think a lot of people are saying that as well. Yes. Yes. I, I think so. And now today, um, the younger generation and all of us really are facing facing a new sort of uh, spiritual challenge. You know, the internet, you know, all of that has has should be drawing us all together. And right here it is. But it also simultaneously can be working against being with each other, you know. And I get that, you know, and I, I don't think it makes us any worse off than previous generations. I mean, would I have wanted to go through the Great Depression? Would I have wanted to be, have given my life on the beaches of Normandy in World War II? You know, so every generation, Civil War, you name it. There's every generation you can look at has these trials and tribulations. And ours have just altered. They're a new style of trial and tribulation because, as we all know, the only constant is change. And everything is changing rapidly. But the one thing that won't change that I know, and it gives me deep comfort, and I wish I could give it to everybody, is God's love. I understand that. And uh, that's a blessing for me. Well, Wayne, I am so enjoying this conversation with you. And I have a lot more questions. But let's take that into part two. Okay. Thanks so much for joining me on Beyond with Heather Tesh. That was part one. Make sure to listen to part two. And if you liked what you heard, please hit the thumbs up button and subscribe for more episodes.